Uh, clock says 14 past, but who cares? Um, I wanted to advertise these books. That's why I had them in the background, but I forgot to advertise the books. Analysis in Barnack Spaces, Volume 1 and 2. They're thick books. Um, this is basically where I learned most of the field. It's by a bunch of people. Two of them are in Delft in the Netherlands, where I did a postdoc, where I learned all of this stuff. And it's a good book. Um, you, can, you can buy it legally. You can obtain it illegally. This part's not going to go on YouTube, but you know where to find it. Um, also, there's a book by PZA called Martin Girls in Barnack Spaces, which is also really good, but I don't have a hard copy of it to show you. So it's also good. Um, yeah, legally or illegally obtain it. It's probably at your university library that you're not allowed to go into. Or maybe you can access soft copies through your library. I don't know. Get those books. They're good. So what's the next topic? Bochner spaces still, but now we're going to move to my favorite topic, sort of duality of Bochner spaces. Which is interesting. This is a story that's going to last some weeks and we're going to come back to it later on. And it's just, yeah, good fun. Am I recording? Yes, I am. Okay. so. Recall, I've been using the dual space quite a few times in these lectures already without really fully explaining what it is because I assumed everybody knew what it was. Just to be really clear, the dual space of a Barnack space X is the space of all functionals, which I call X star generally, that are linear and bounded. Now this X star, this is just notation. This has nothing to do with the vector X. I just like to call vectors in X by X and vectors in X star by X star. And maybe it was a bad move to do that, but whatever. And the dual pairing of a, a functional against a vector. So this is for all X in X, X star in X star. This dual pairing is just a, I write it with the angle brackets. What I mean is this is X star acting on X. So this is a scalar. I probably should have said this yesterday because I've written this notation enough that if you didn't know it, you were probably confused. Now you know what it is. And the norm of a functional. So this X star is actually a Barnack space. Is the supremum over all vectors in X that are not zero. Of the value of this pairing of its absolute value divided by the norm of X or equivalently by rescaling everything out. The supremum over all vectors of norm one of the absolute value of the pairing. So Alex, is, yep. is, that the, is that the operator norm? It's the operator norm, yeah. Okay. Look, this is the X star is just the space of bounded linear operators from X to the scalar field. And then it's the operator norm, exactly. Yeah, I can also write this as L X K space of linear operators with its operator norm. Okay, so the general philosophy of duality of Barnack spaces is if you have a Barnack space, then it has a dual space and that is a Barnack space. And then the question usually is what is that dual space? Okay, the dual space is the space of linear functionals. That's not an interesting answer because that doesn't tell you anything we didn't already know. What you want to know is given a Barnack space, is its dual space something that we can actually recognize in a different way? But can we provide a representation of all of these functionals in some more concrete way than saying it's just the functionals, right? So for example, we know about duality of LP spaces. I'll explain that. For an exponent P between one and infinity, we define the Hölder conjugate exponent. I'll just the Hölder conjugate P prime. The simplest way of defining it is saying it's P on P minus one, which gives you issues when P is one or infinity. But the interpretation is that one prime is infinity and infinity prime is one. If you plug in P equals one into this expression, that all makes sense, right? What this satisfies is that one on P plus one on P prime equals one, where you have the, the only reasonable interpretations of one on P or one on P prime when they're infinite. One on infinity zero, yeah. Then 
Okay, how, do, how does duality of LP spaces and Bochner spaces work? So given a measure space, and a Banach space. Every function, sorry, every function G in LP prime of S valued in the dual space induces a functional on LP valued in X. So this is going to be how the duality works. So if we're thinking about the dual space of LP valued in X, first we can say, well, functions in LP prime valued in the dual of X can be seen as functionals on this space. This functional we call phi of G. And we define it like this for all F in LP valued in X, the dual pairing of phi g against f is the integral over s of f of s paired against g of s. Now this, I'm being very um, lax with my angles here. This is the dual pairing LP between LP and LP prime. And this is the dual pairing between x and x star. f of s is an x, g of s is an x star. Now I'm going to use this pairing for every dual pair around without actually notating what it is. How do we know that this is actually a continuous linear functional? I mean, linearity is kind of clear because the integral is linear. This is a Lebesgue integral, by the way. This is not a vector valued integral. This, this here is a scalar valued function. The continuity just comes from Holder's inequality, basically. So if you take the absolute value of the pairing, you put the absolute value inside the integral. Now you use the definition of the, the operator norm or the, the dual norm here to control this by the norm of f of s in x times the norm of g of s in x star. If you're not really familiar with dual spaces, this is how the, the dual norm works really. It's basically the definition. And then by Hölder's inequality, this is controlled by the LP norm of f. valued in X. I mean, you do the Holder inequality for scalar valued functions and you apply it to the pointwise norm functions, which are scalar valued functions. So the LP norm of F times the LP prime norm of G, keeping in mind that F is valued in X and G is valued in X star. They're not valued in the same space, unless X is X star, but that's, you know, that doesn't always happen. So what this computation tells you is that the norm of phi g as a functional so this dual norm is bounded by the norm of g as a function in lp everyone got that this should be fairly straightforward from classic scalar valued measure theory lebesgue spaces now it's all just vector valued and we have to use the the dual pairing so what this is telling you is that the map phi, this maps from LP prime valued in X star into LP valued in X, the dual of that space. So this map phi is bounded and has norm less than or equal to one because here you don't have any, any constant here. This is what's called a non-expansive map. It's not a contraction because the norm is not less than one, but it's less than or equal to one. You're not blowing up any norms anywhere. Of course, more than this is true. This is just what Holder's inequality tells you. Now, when X is the scalar field, so when you're looking at scalar valued functions, and when P is between one and infinity, not including infinity, Phi is actually an isometric isomorphism. So it preserves norms. It's not just that it doesn't shrink them or it doesn't expand them. It doesn't shrink them either. It preserves norms and it's an isomorphism. 
So it's actually invertible. So you can go back in the other direction and every functional can actually be seen. This is probably the important thing. Every functional, let's call it phi in LP dual is of the form phi equals capital phi G for some G. And the norm of phi in the dual norm of phi is equal to the norm of G as a function. It should be LP prime. So going back to this philosophy of dual spaces, this is telling you the, the dual of LP is LP prime with a certain canonical identification. So you've got this one viewpoint, okay, the dual space consists of abstract bounded linear functionals, but you can also say this dual space is the space of functions in LP prime. And the dual pairing is given by integration of functions against functions. Whenever you talk about an identification of a dual space, you need to talk about the identification of the dual pairing as well as what the spaces are to make everything work. So that's in the scalar valued case. And of course we're doing Barnack valued analysis. So what happens in the Barnack valued setting? This is a question, I'm gonna phrase it as a question. For which Barnack space is X is phi defined as follows. For which X is phi an isomorphism or an isometric perhaps? And furthermore, how does this depend on the measure space? It could very well be that the answer depends on the measure space as well as the Barnack space. Maybe it sometimes fails. Maybe it works for nice measure spaces, but not all Barnack spaces. Maybe it just works for all Barnack spaces, right? I haven't told you the answer yet. If you've read the notes, you know the answer. But I'll give you the answer. We're not gonna prove it all now, but well, if and only if X has what's called the radon nicotine property. Whatever that is. This is ultimately a course about properties of Barnard spaces, right? There's RNP, there's UMD, there's MCP that will come up at some point. There's other properties, but anyway, this duality property holds if and only if X has the radon nicotine property. And if it holds for the unit interval with the Lebesgue measure, it holds for all measure spaces. So this partially answers the question of how it depends on the measure space. If you have it for a sufficiently rich measure space and the unit interval is sufficiently rich, then you have it for all measure spaces. And I haven't said this, but it also works for all P, not including infinity because that doesn't even work in the scalar valued case. So let me just say for all P between one and infinity, if you have it for one, you have it for all, it turns out. And remember that we're assuming that every measure space is sigma finite this result doesn't actually hold if your measure space is not sigma finite, but every measure space is sigma finite. It'll take a few weeks to really build up to the radon nicotine property and actually proving this in full. And we're gonna do it with detours. We're not gonna do it directly. We're gonna do it the more fun way. So let's do a first duality result. Something that actually works for all Barnard spaces. So it's not the full result, but something that just works in general. So we have a measure space and a Barnack space. I'm not gonna write them down. For all P between one and infinity, including infinity, the map phi that I keep having to write out in full, the map phi is an isometry onto a closed subspace of the dual space. And this subspace is norming for LP. And I'll say what that means. Just before I say what it means to be norming, what this result says is that phi is an isometry, but it doesn't say that it's surjective. It doesn't say that it's an isomorphism. So you don't know that every functional can be realized as integration against a function. 
but you do know that the norm of this functional given by integrating against a function is the norm of the function. So that's the first step, it's something. The norming property says that for all f in LP, you can realize the norm of f by testing against functionals in this class. So the norm of f is the supremum over all g in LP prime valued in the dual space of norm one. So the supremum over all g of the integral of f against g. By the way, if we knew that phi was an isomorphism, this would follow. This being an, phi being an isomorphism is an isometric isomorphism is stronger than this. But at least we have this norming property for all Barnack spaces. No assumptions on the Barnack space, no assumptions on the measure space. I don't think you even need sigma finiteness for this, but don't, don't quote me on that. And this is quite useful because it just tells you that this thing here is useful because you, you do this all the time in measure theory and in analysis. You estimate an LP norm of a function by duality. You test against all functions in the dual space and then you, you estimate this integral here. What this tells you is that you can do this for Barnack valued functions as well without any assumption on the Barnack space. It doesn't mean you've identified all the functionals. It just means that these functionals are enough to recover the norms, which is useful. I'll prove some of this. One of the cases is annoying, so I won't do the annoying case. I'll do the slightly simpler case. The case where P is greater than one is the easy case. When P equals one, it gets harder. Now let me just check time, we're good for time. All right. What do we need to show? We need to show, that's what NTS means. We need to show for all G in LP prime, valid in the dual space, which are normalized. By homogeneity, we can assume that the norm of G is one. Everything scales nicely here. We don't have to do it in the abstract. But we need to show that the norm of phi G as a functional is greater than or equal to one because we already proved less than or equal to. That, was, that came from Holder and greater than or equal to one because we assumed that the norm of G was one. Now we're only doing the case P greater than one because what this tells you is that P prime is less than infinity, right? Because one prime is infinity, everything, you know, the Helder conjugate flips orders, P prime is less than infinity. And this tells you that the simple functions are dense in LP prime which I stated before, but didn't prove because the proof's tedious and you can read it in the notes. Since the map phi is continuous, we already know that, we're just proving that it's an isometry. Since phi is continuous, it suffices to, to prove that phi is an isometry, it suffices to check on a dense subspace, right? So it suffices to assume that G is simple. Now we're starting to see why we want to have approximations by simple functions everywhere. It's, just, it's a lot easier to check things on simple functions, right? You can assume G is simple. Let's write it out in this form. So it's a finite sum of characteristic functions in the direction of functionals because G is X star valued. We can assume that the measures of these sets are positive and finite because G has to be in LP prime. And if any of these measures were infinite, G would not be in LP prime. We assume that these sets SN are pairwise disjoint. And we assume that the vectors XN star, they are functionals and they're non-zero. Just to make the simple function, this is just a, a nice canonical kind of representation of the simple function G. Now let's get to work. We've set everything up. We're going to fix an epsilon greater than zero. 
arbitrarily because we're doing analysis. And we choose the unit vectors uh, xn in x. These are depending on e, no, e epsilon. So epsilon dependent unit vectors in x such that when you pair the vectors against the functionals that are making up the simple function g, this pairing has to be greater than or equal to the, the dual norm of the functionals times one minus epsilon. The thing with this, um, what do I wanna say about this? The thing with this dual norm is that you can't easily just find a vector that actually achieves the supreme necessarily. So, but you can get within, you can get arbitrarily close to the, to the dual norm. So you fix an epsilon and you pick xn's that are within epsilon in a sense of that norm. And epsilon's arbitrary. So what do we do now? If we define a function, this is gonna be the function that we test g against to show that its norm is large enough. Find a function f depending on epsilon. It's x valued and it's defined like this. So it's defined sort of like g. It's also a simple function. It's also concentrated on the sets sn but the vectors we choose are xn normalized appropriately. So we take the, the norm of xn star to the p prime minus one. You just pull it out of nowhere because it works. So what do we need to show? We need to compute the LP norm of this function to show that it's actually in LP and has a nice controlled LP norm. And we need to show that when we test when we test G against it, then the norm is large enough. And then we can conclude that the norm of uh, phi G, the function of phi G is greater than or equal to one if everything works out properly. So first let's compute the LP norm to the peak power, just to make it a little bit simpler. And we're gonna use disjointness of the sets SN so when you take the LP norm of a function, if you know that this function is just a sum of disjointly supported things, then you can evaluate the LP norms on those sets separately. Apparently I'm being too loud. <laughs> so let's write this out. First, just the definition. Uh, Xn. It's an X valued function doing it in LP. Now we use the disjoint supports. Disjoint support. So we can pull that sum out. And we look at it as an integral over SN for each of these Ns. We have the norm of this functional to the P times P prime minus one because we have a P prime minus one here and a P here we get the norm of xn in x to the p and we integrate that in s. Now, first we've noticed that the xn's that we chose, these are unit vectors. So these are all equal to one and that drops out. And this function here that we're integrating over s doesn't depend on s. So we just get the measure of sn popping out in that integral. And we get this thing here. And now we do a quick computation. What's P times P prime minus one? What's P prime? It's P on P minus one. This is minus one. P on P minus one minus P minus one on P minus one. You should never do these computations in public. They're horrible. This is P on one on P minus one, P minus P plus one, yep. And this is P prime. Great. Holder conjugates always satisfy magic equalities. Okay, so now what's this? Now we start to unpack this derivation the way we started before 
we can see that this is actually the integral over s of a simple function. There's a p prime here. And what's this simple function? This is g. This is the g that we started with. So what we have is the LP prime norm to the P prime power of G. And we assumed that G was normalized so that it had LP norm one, LP prime norm one. So what have we shown here to zoom out? So this F epsilon, this test function we constructed has norm one just by virtue of its construction and a little bit of checking. Now let's test our functional phi g against this test function f epsilon to estimate its norm from below. So this is the integral. I'm going to write everything out explicitly rather than doing it all in my head. What was this exponent here? P prime minus one. So we have one simple function being integrated against another simple function. Maybe I should call this M instead of N here because they're not the same index, but you can understand what's going on here. Now we have this disjoint support property again. You're gonna have an SN term and an SM term. If, if I, maybe I should call this M, M from one to N. Whenever you have these cross terms with n and m not equal, you're integrating over Sn intersect Sm. Now these sets are disjoint, so that vanishes. You only have the diagonal terms. So this is the sum over n, the integral over Sn of this normalizing factor times the pairing of Xn against Xn star d mu. Now, remember the way we chose these unit vectors xn is such that this pairing is greater than or equal to one minus epsilon times the norm of xn star by definition, yeah? So this whole thing here is greater than or equal to one minus epsilon sum over n. We have a measure of sn because the integrand is s independent. And we have this normalizing factor here, P prime minus one. And we have this XN star norm here. Now these two things are the same, of course, but you have a P prime minus one power and a power one. So this can just vanish and this P prime minus one can just become P prime. And as before, this here is the norm of G in LP prime. We already computed that to the P prime power. And that's equal to one because of how we normalize G. So what we have is just one minus epsilon. So when you test phi G against this function, which has norm one, you get one minus epsilon. So this tells you that the norm of phi G as a functional is greater than or equal to one minus epsilon. And this was true for all epsilon greater than zero. So it is greater than or equal to one, which is the first thing we wanted to show. This shows you that phi is an isometry. That wasn't the whole statement of this thing. We said it was an isometry onto a closed subspace of the dual space. It's okay, it's an isometry. It's gonna to have to be onto a closed subspace. Everything's okay there. But we also need to show this norming property. I will just point out before we get to the norming property, the case P equals one is in the notes. The issue here is that L infinity doesn't have the simple functions as a dense subspace. So you can't just reduce down to simple functions. You have to work a little bit harder, but in the end you can do a similar kind of argument and just extract a, a testing function that does the job. It's worth checking in the notes for that. The proof's not really too hard. Now the norming property, it's probably the most important property. Let's just evaluate norms by duality. We're gonna do a funny little argument via the double dual 
here. We're going to basically bootstrap what we already know to get the norming property, which is nice. So remember, I assume you've, you've all done functional analysis, right? You have an embedding, a canonical isometric embedding from a Barnack space into its double dual. The double dual is the dual of its dual. This is not necessarily X, right? If X is reflexive, then X double dual is just X, but X is arbitrary here. This is the canonical isometric embedding. The way that this is defined is that, so J of X is an element of the dual of X dual. So you have to say what it does on every element of the dual for every X star in the dual space. J of X acts on X prime as X times from X star as X star acts on X. Really nice notation here. So what this is saying is that J X of X star is X star of X. And this really messes with your brain if you're not used to it, but eventually you get used to it. So we're gonna use this. Given an F in LP valued in X, we're gonna compute its norm by duality but well, we're going to show that you can compute this on by duality. You can define a function J composed with F or F composed with J, however you want to call that. This is mapping S into X. Well, it's mapping S into X double star. You take F, which maps into X, and then you compose it with J, which maps X into X's double deal. So let's look at the norm of F. Just looking at the definition, you take this pointwise norm function and you measure it in the scalar valued LP space. Now, since J is an isometric embedding, J is an isometry, you can replace the norm of F with the norm of J composed with F. That's not a problem. This here is the Bochner norm of F composed with J, but now valued in the double dual of X. Now we use the phi as an isometry. And this is equal to the norm of phi of J composed with F as a functional on LP prime valued in X star. <laughs> because X double star is the, the dual of X star. And then we use the definition of the dual norm. This is the supremum over all G in LP prime, valued in X star of norm one, of the integral of G, well, the, the action of the functional phi J composed F against G. Now this is the integral of G against J of F. Yeah. And now we use the definition of the embedding J. J just flips the order in the dual pairing. So let's just say supremum over normalized G. Now it's F of S paired with G of S. And just to make clear what's going on here, this is an X star valued function and this is an X double star valued function. And the definition of J flips the order. This is an X valued function. This is an X star valued function. And this is what we wanted to show. <laughs> and we're done. It's kind of a miraculous proof that one. It's, I saw that for the first time. I thought, wow, this is nice. What were we trying to show? We we're trying to show that the norm of F can be realized by pairing against all functions in LP prime, a certain restricted set of, of functionals in the dual space that we can compute explicitly. And this shows that LP prime is norming for LP in, in short, for every Barnack space, no assumptions. Okay, are there any questions about that proof or that theorem? Because that's the end of the theorem. I'm gonna Sorry. go back to the statement, yeah. So that second last inequality where you've gotten that supremum. That's this one? The, 
That's yeah. So that's the operator norm. Yep. Over LP prime. Uh, okay. All right. Yep. There's a bit to unpack here, but. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in this proof. I, I reckon, like, I was going to say go home and study this proof, but I presume you are at home. Um, study this proof. <laughs> it's, um, it's, 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 yeah, this is a really nice proof. I, I wish I came up with this. I didn't come up with this. I don't think I came up with this. I can't remember anymore. Maybe I did. I don't think I did. It's good. I shouldn't say it's such a clever proof if I came up with it, should I? <laughs> it's nice. Any other questions about it? Okay, we still have a bit of time. We've got 10 minutes, I guess, if we want to finish at 12. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I've got my little overflow sheet of paper here, like what to talk about if I still have 10 minutes at the end. And I was right, I do still have 10 minutes at the end. I'm going to talk about probably my favorite open problem in Barnack valued analysis, because now I can tell you what it is. My favorite. Open problem. Actually, this isn't just my favorite open problem in Barnack valued analysis. It's my favorite open problem, I have to say. If you consider the dual of the scalar value L infinity space over N bounded sequences, it's not L1. This is classic functional analysis. It's bigger than L1. I should say that actually explicitly contains and it's not equal to L1. And of course, what I mean by like, this is a dual space, it's a space of linear functionals, but you have an identification of L1. But the, the argument I gave before says that L1 embeds into this space of functionals by integrating against the functions. And this map phi is not going to be an isomorphism. It's very much not going to be an isomorphism. Actually, the dual space is bigger. You have the space called BA of N, which is the space of finitely additive measures on N of bounded variation. You can do this on more general measure spaces as well, not just N, but N is the easiest one to state it over. Uh, what does finitely additive mean? You know what a measure is. A measure mu on N has the assumption of being countably additive. which says that the measure of a countable union of disjoint sets is the sum of the measures of each of the set. This is countable additivity. Uh, you say that new is new is like a measure, but it's not going to be countably additive. It's finitely additive. If this property holds for finite unions, but not necessarily for countably infinite unions. In particular, if a measure is countably additive, then it's finitely additive. Finite additivity is weaker. Uh, yeah, so there exists finitely additive mu that are not countably additive. The way you can construct these is actually take the space L infinity N and use Hahn Barnack to construct things that are finitely additive, but not measures. Like they're not countably additive. So they fail being a measure in the usual sense. In particular, to construct these finitely additive measures that aren't countably additive, you need to get into set theory, you use axiom of choice or strong ultra filter lemma or something like that. You, you get into set theory but I assume the axiom of choice. So you can do this. You can find in particular new such that new of every singleton is zero, but new of the natural numbers themselves is positive. So you can't really recover measures of infinite sets from measures of finite sets if you don't have countable additivity. You can only do it finitely many times. Basically, this finite additivity property doesn't tell you anything about infinite sets. So you have these kind of strange pathological finitely additive measures. And you have that the dual of L infinity is this space of finitely additive measures as with finite with bounded variation as well, if you know what the variation of a measure is. 
So the question is if X is infinite dimensional, what is the dual of the Bochner space L infinity N valued in X? This is wide open. I have no idea what this is. I don't think anybody has any idea what this is. Even for Hilbert spaces, nobody knows what this is, I don't think. I've asked some people what's the answer to this. Nobody knows. Um, I was once told to ask somebody what, what it was and we emailed them and they died. So I don't think this had anything to do with it, but <laughs> I didn't get an answer from them. And sadly, they were probably one of the people who would have known the most about this. So that didn't quite work out. I can say though, it isn't the analog of, well, it isn't what you think it would be. It isn't the finitely additive X star valued measures. There are vector measures. I'm going to introduce them later on. It's not the finitely additive vector measures of bounded variation on the dual space. This is what you would expect it to be. It's not that unless X is finite dimension. And this ultimately boils down to the fact that the simple functions aren't dense in L infinity. The way that you get your dual space of L infinity to be a space of measures is you test them against simple functions and simple functions reduce down to characteristic functions of sets. So these functionals have to be measures in a sense. But when simple functions aren't dense, it tells you that functionals are not going to correspond to measures. So you just have some more generalized object, which seems to have no simpler description out there. So a related open problem to this, which is maybe not quite as interesting, but very much linked. Are there interesting dense subspaces? of L infinity valued in X if X is infinite dimensional. You can come up with a lot of obviously dense subspaces, like you take a dense subspace of X and then you look at all the functions that are valued in a dense subset of X. And then you look at all the functions that are valued in that dense subset. That's gonna be dense in L infinity, but that space is already really big and doesn't really tell you much. This question is very vague. Uh, what's, what's an interesting dense subspace? I don't have a rigorous definition of interesting, but basically I've not been able to come up with any dense subspaces of this space that tell you anything new, particularly nothing which tells you anything about the dual space. So that's a, yeah, an interesting open problem. If you can make any progress on that, excellent. That's a, that's a good paper right there. I tried for a while, I've got nothing. I guess that's the end of the lecture. Are there any questions? So, so L1 of NX is a dense subspace, but not interesting. Is that correct? Is L1 dense? Oh, sorry, you're not talking about the dual. Sorry. Okay. No, I was. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, no, here I'm not talking about the dual. Yeah, L1 okay. is. Is L1 dense in B? No, L1's not dense. L is weakly oh, dense. dense. No, it, weak sorry, star dense. I missed, I, missed, uh, I missed the missing dual. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, the other question in, in the previous question would. Uh, would you want to make some assumptions on X, such as the Rado Nicodem property? Or something? Exactly, like the Rado Nicodem property is probably very relevant here. Probably. Yeah, but you don't. Like, have I, any... I just I don't have anything. I, I want to know what sort of assumptions can you make other than finite dimensionality that let you say something. Actually, I, I, I slightly lied. There's only one thing that's known here. If X is an L infinity space itself then you can say something because L infinity of N valued in L infinity of something else is going to be L infinity on the product space. And you know what the dual of that is, it's BA of something. So other than the case of L infinity spaces themselves, I don't know what goes on here. And the funny thing is L infinity doesn't have the right on Nicodem property. <laughs> so maybe you can only say something when your space doesn't have the right on Nicodem property. <laughs> it should be very weird. I don't think that's gonna be the case. Okay, and you know, maybe I have a final question. Uh, yeah. So you had this thing you were, you're going to come back with. I don't think a dim yeah. property implies uh, uh, something for all LP, right? Um, it, it implies that you have this duality result that the, the dual right. of LP is LP prime. Is it fair to say that the case P equal one of that statement is more or less the definition of Radon Nicodem property. 
with a little bit of work it is it's not quite immediate but yeah you you can go directly from the rod on nicotine property i think yeah you, you could prove the equivalence of these two things directly without going through all the detours that i'm going to go through but i'm going to go through detours because it lets you prove other things as well so, so, so in a way maybe the hard part of the theorem is that this property which characterizes the dual this duality property is the same for all p, right? And once it's the same for all p, you're reduced to L1. Which I think probably the hardest thing is actually showing that it's, if you have it for one measure space, you have it for all of them. Because what this is so also implicitly even telling you. Yeah. is hard. Even in L1, that's hard, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's telling you that if you have this duality result for the unit interval, then you have it for all measure spaces. Mm -hmm. And you can probably prove that directly in some way, but um, I'm not going to do it that way. Yeah. I'm going to relate it to Martingale convergence because we're going to talk about the UMD property later on. So the best thing to do is go through Martingale convergence, also go through properties of convex sets in Barnack spaces. You, you, I think we end up seeing like five equivalent versions of the Radon nicotine property. And you get this nice chain of this one implies that one, this one implies that one, you know, rather than the direct ones. Then you get all this nice measure space independence or P independence as a consequence of that. Okay, great. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. End of lecture. End of recording. <laughs>